welcome everybody, students, parents, alums, reunion uh, members. My name is Jean Howard and I'm chair of the Pembroke Center Associates. And we're a group of alums who support the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. And we organize programs like this one that bring together alumni and the center. The Pembroke Center was founded in 1981 and it's a research and teaching center that explores social change and how questions of difference such as gender, race, class, and religion affect our family and the world. The Pembroke Center archives preserve the history of Brown and Rhode Island women and the intellectual history of feminist scholars. And I want to put in a plug here. If you're an alum and you have interesting materials in your attic, about your time at Brown, we would like to have them donated to the Pembroke Archives if you were part of an organization. Um, have interesting photos, belong to the BDH staff, whatever, we would like to have those. Today our co-sponsor is the Women's Leadership Council, a group of women, Brown women, who promote philanthropy and volunteerism, and they have a successful mentoring program, the Women's Launch Pad, that works to engage Brown alums with the university. Now to get right to it, it's my pleasure today to introduce Betsy, there you are, Betsy West, who's gonna be our moderator. She's the Fred W. Friendly Professor of Professional Practice in Media and Society at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism and is herself a filmmaker. For her work at ABC News Nightline and as co-creator and executive producer of Turning Point, Betsy has garnered 21 Emmy Awards and two DuPont Columbia Awards. As Senior Vice President of CBS News from 1998 to 2005, she oversaw 60 Minutes and 48 Hours and was executive in charge of the award-winning documentary 9-11. In 2006, she co-produced Orrin Jacoby's theatrical documentary, documentary Constantine's Sword for St Storyville Films. Also with Orrin, and in celebration of Brown's 250th anniversary, Betsy made The Brown Difference, a film I think some of you have seen, with archival footage and new material based upon their distinct vision of the past, present, and future of Brown. She was also executive producer of Makers, Women Who Make America, the online video archive and PBS documentary about the women's movement that aired nationwide in 2013. I'm very ha happy that she's leading our conversation today. Buddy, hi. So it's such an honor to be introduced by Professor Jean Howard. Um, I just want to say that uh, Jean is not only a renowned Shakespeare scholar, one of the people behind the, the much-loved Norton Shakespeare, but um, also one of the first scholars to look at early drama from a feminist lens. Uh, which wasn't something that was exactly being done back in the days when I was an English major. And uh, the other notable thing about uh, Professor Howard, who is a Brown grad and a Yale PhD, is that this weekend she's receiving an honorary degree. So congratulations and thank you very much. Um, um, yeah. I'm just going to do quick uh, intros here. Uh, just to say, you know, not so long ago, uh, documentary used to be known as the D word. Um, you know, documentaries were thought to be worthy and noble and sometimes dull. <laughs> but that's certainly no longer the perception or the reality. And um, it's a very exciting time to be a documentary filmmaker. We are extremely lucky to have four of the best here in the room today, all of them Brown grads. So I'm going to do a quick introduction, show you a few short clips from each of their work so you can experience the range of the filmmakers represented here today. Uh, starting right here, immediately to my left, is Marcelo Gaviria. She's the class of 91. Uh, she's produced over 30 documentaries at Rain Media for the investigative series Frontline. Uh, she's won just about every journalism award in the book, including the DuPont Columbia, George Polk, three Peabody Awards. Among her topics, Al-Qaeda, Afghanistan, and most recently, an eye-opening film about America's heroin epidemic. So we're going to take a look. This isn't clean. It is. Dude, I'm clean. Here, that's clear. Christina Block says she first tried smoking heroin when she was a teenager. 
I'll help you out, bro. Don't worry. When I was 14, I tried heroin, and it just like made everything feel like safe and okay. Can I give you enough cleans? Yeah. I think I got really trapped in it because, I mean, I guess I didn't know too much about what addiction was. Thank you. And it just became so second nature. It just, it consumed me. She moved to injecting by the time she was 16. I was friends with this girl who was like 24 and she was shooting up regular, like that's how she did it. And I just was kind of interested in it. And I asked her to hit me one time. Christina is now 70 years into her addiction. It's just so insane what this drug like can, can make you do. Like it literally has a brain and it shares mine, you know? But right now, how much heroin is in your system? Probably like $40 worth. So what determines how much you use? Well, I, uh, the number one thing that determines how much I use is how much money I have or how much dope I have. Sitting to Marcella's left is Roy Kennedy, also from the class of 91. She's president and co-founder of Moxie Firecracker, which is one of the most successful and prolific documentary uh, production uh, companies in the country, probably the world. Um, Rory has produced and directed 30 films, including Ghost of uh, Abu uh, Ghraib, for which she won a primetime enemy, Ethel, the poignant film about her mother, and her most recent doc, uh, The Searing Last Days of Vietnam, nominated for an Academy Award, and here is an excerpt. My mom grabbed my little sister, who was about six months at that time, and I have a little brother who was about three or four years old, myself. We quickly ran into the Chinook, and uh, we all flew off out into the Pacific Ocean. My dad was afraid for not having enough fuel. Afraid for a lot of things. He was just flying blind. And then he saw a ship out there. In the middle of the day, after we had taken those first helicopters aboard, this huge helicopter called a Chinook, they came out and tried to land on the ship. And, oh, we almost, the thing almost crashed on board our ship. This big Chinook showed up. There's no way he can land on Kirk without impacting the ship. He, he would have killed everybody on the helicopter plus my crew. It was way too big to land. We thought that the helicopter would just fly away. But as the ship was moving forward, probably four, five, six knots, something like that, the pilot communicated that he was running low on fuel. He opened up the port side of the helicopter and he hovered across the stern of the Kirk. Then all of a sudden, here comes a human. One by one, we jump out. I jumped out, my brother jumped out, my mom was holding my, my sister. Obviously very scared. And she just, you know, just trustingly, just with one hand, with her right hand, holding on with her left to brace herself, you know, just dropped uh, my baby sister. One fellow standing there, and he said he looked up and he saw this big bundle of stuff come flying out, and it was a baby. It was the one-year-old baby. And then the mother jumped out, and he caught her too. To Rory's left, Allison Clayman, class of 06. She was named one of the 20 rising directors to watch by the New York Times. Uh, this was after she hit a home run with her first documentary, 
Ai Weiwei, Never Sorry, which premiered at Sundance and was shortlisted for an Academy Award. Here's a clip. There are particular moments which allow a voice to change the way that people think. He said, Beijing, Andy Warhol. He wants to shock you. When you see him drop a Neolithic pot, he's saying, I love the culture, but I want something new. I think the most important media of our time is Twitter. They call him Ai Shen online, I got. That's a very dangerous description in China. What inspired you to come up with this project? Is he really allowed to say these things? Are you worried? Yes, I am worried. If I don't push, it's not going to happen. It gets to him at the very end. I was thinking, don't do it. You're not going to be the one. Who? I, I can breathe because I know the danger is really there. If you don't act, the danger becomes stronger. He's probably the only Chinese artist who really cares about this country. He put his life on the line for something that he believes in. And finally, at the far end here is Debbie Lum. She's another member of the very talented class of 91. Um, <laughs> And uh, a longtime accomplished film editor who made her feature length directing debut with Seeking Asian Female. Uh, the, female uh, the film premiered at uh, South by Southwest. It won festival awards and aired on Independent Lens. Take a look. The first time I visited Stephen in his own home. I had to fight the urge to turn around and leave. Your hair looks cute. You look very Chinese with her bangs. <laughs> you know I like that. <laughs> I've spent most of my life trying to avoid men like Steven, but when he agreed to let me film him, I just dove in. There's my first Asian girlfriend. I don't look at blondes or redheads. I turn and look at Chinese. I've always wondered why certain Western men have a thing for Asian women. So I contacted men who posted online personal ads exclusively seeking Asian women would you mind stating for the camera your name and your dating preference? My name's Ken. I'm a police officer. I know for a fact that I'll end up marrying an Asian girl. Like, I, I just know that. My name is Gordon. I'm a white Caucasian male. It really makes no difference where she's from within the Asian subcontinent. With Asian women, it's just like, bam. Some call these men Asia files or guys with yellow fever. And here in California, it seems like they're everywhere. It's their hair. It's the long black hair that's really eye-catching. It's the whole mysterious kind of look, dark eyes. I think they give more consideration 
to how the man feels than sometimes themselves. This little thing right underneath the eye. This is how I met Steven. Just, just, uh, you know, the, the, where the eyelid cut is just like, knocks me out. There's this Vietnamese movie called The Scent of Green Papaya. We just got this uh, idyllic uh, servant girl who would cooks these beautiful meals. And you think, gee, would it be like that? No. I had a feeling I had found the perfect documentary subject. I knew Stephen would tell me everything I ever wanted to know about his obsession for Asian women. Wow, what an amazing array of films. I mean, you know, uh, if you haven't seen them, you, you have to see all these films because they're just fantastic. And um, it really does seem that a lot of great filmmakers have spent time on College Hill. Uh, I want to ask each one of you a little bit about your path to filmmaking and perhaps what role Brown played in it. So I'll, I'll start with you, Marcella. Is this live? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. It's so great to be here with these amazing women and you who have been an idol of mine ever since I wrote you a letter uh, applying for work. <laughs> Did I uh, write back? <laughs> well, that, that might have been fortuitous. Yeah. But uh, my, my career at Brown actually began as a pre-med, which is probably why I'm channeling white here. And, um, and I think it quickly ended when I killed the mouse at the neuroscience lab. But I, um, I actually, the day that I graduated, 25 years ago, my father handed me a camera. And I was like, what am I going to do with this? I've never held one in my life. And I, you know, it was before iPhone videos. And I, I started making a little film um, in a town where I was volunteering, um, you know, vaccinating kids and anything to get myself into medical school. And it was, um, the beginning of my sort of passion for filmmaking. And it was kind of like, great, now I know what I want to do. How on earth am I going to become a filmmaker? Um, because my resume, all it had was things about operating rats and stuff. And so I had to kind of figure out how to get my way in. And I started writing to Frontline. Um, and one day, they happened to have commissioned a film about a drug lord called Paulo Escobar. And I happen to be from Colombia, even though I'm half Irish American, which is why I don't look Colombian. And they said, well, your resume sucks, but you know, you're Colombian, maybe, maybe you could translate. And so I said to the guy that was producing this film on Pablo Escobar, why don't you just give me five days to prove to you that I'm the person you should hire? And I worked so hard, and I got the photographer for Escobar to give me photos, and I figured out where the mom was and the brother, and I kind of worked it. And that was the beginning of a long career um, covering mainly very dicey places, and every once in a while doing strange things. Like now that I'm the resident um, drug expert at Frontline, I get heroin, so. <laughs> so, Rory, you were already making films when you were here at Brown, is that right? Can you tell me a little bit about your path? Um, yeah, well, I wasn't actually making films here, so I was a women's studies major, and um, I was doing my final kind of paper thesis on um, the difficulties that women addicts, drug addicts had getting treatment, particularly pregnant women and women with children. And this was a time when there were a lot of stories in the press about crack moms having crack babies, and there was kind of a backlash, and there was a, a kind of national trend towards incarcerating these pregnant women um, in order to protect these children. And so I started doing research and I, at, at, for this final paper at Brown, and as I was researching it, I realized that many of these women had tried to get treatment, had been turned away at the centers. They weren't able to even get the care because the, these programs were concerned about what would happen to pregnant women and liability issues and whatnot. And you know, I felt that 
these, and, and I started talking to women in these situations, and I felt that, gosh, you know, they have such a compelling story, and it's in such contrast to what I'm seeing in the press, you know, crack baby, crack moms, and, you know, who don't care about their babies. They cared so much about their children, and they would do anything to get care, and they weren't able to get it. And I felt that if we could get that information and their stories out there, you could change this national trend to incarcerate them, which was really having really negative effects because it was turning women away from the care that they needed. Anyway, so I thought, well, I can't bring all these women to Capitol Hill, but I could bring my a camera into their living rooms and make a film about them and then bring that film to Capitol Hill. So. Um, once I graduated, I wrote a proposal and I talked to different production companies about the idea and there was one in DC that I really liked and they loved the idea and we partnered and I went on to make my first film which was called Women of Substance, which was a one hour documentary and then we made like a 10 minute education advocacy version of that which we did in fact show on Capitol Hill. and. Um, and I just fell in love with the process of making films, of going into these living rooms, really understanding these stories on from the from you know the people who were living it. I felt like the I loved editing the storytelling of it all, and then I loved sharing it and seeing the impact that it had. So I've been making making films ever since. And I will just add one other thing about the influence of Brown, which is that my future business partner Liz Garbus was also a graduate. Of Brown and her film um, about Nina Simone just got nominated last year for an Academy Award. So um, we we met here at Brown. We became partners a few years after graduation, and we've continued to be partners ever since for you know 20 years. So um, so I owe a lot to Brown and 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 to women's studies. So I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> Allison. Tell us about your path. <laughs> um, I feel like so, so many ways that uh, I came to film are connected to, to Brown as well. Um, I really worked a lot in radio at Brown. I studied history, um, and I worked at news at WBRU, and I also, uh, senior year, did one program that was at BSR and also on WRNI, the um, NPR station, and I saw um, but the guy who ran that program last night at Campus Dance, that was really awesome. Um, uh, and um, my professor, Professor Taylor, is also here, who um, taught a radio class, and I took creative nonfiction with her, and she was really nice to let me in, even though I didn't have the prerequisites, so thank you for that. Um, but yeah, so I feel like radio and storytelling, and I really did aspire to do um, documentary film, um, but radio was a more accessible way and I was on the air even freshman year and I just liked the fact that I could go out and report and I could you know, be heard on air um, and I liked the immediate feedback. Um, but then I applied for a CV star grant with a friend named Julia Liu who was also my year and we applied to do a documentary film and it was actually uh, three stories about women's uh, and women and gender related activism at Brown. Uh, one of them being the, the present day one was uh, gender neutral housing and bathrooms. And I was just talking with people last night as well about how, you know, we were filming activists back then and now that's still very much a part of the national conversation, maybe even has really been emerging even more. Um, so yeah, so basically we used resources of a grant to like get equipment and, and get to make a movie and um, it was very much learning along the way, learning to edit, going from editing sound to editing film. Um, and then it was because of Julia that I went to China, and that was where I really, I guess I just decided to try to be freelance as my, um, after, after I graduated, uh, to try to go out and make it, and seeing the example really of, actually more of the radio journalists that I knew that had come out of Brown. They're like, you can just go and be a stringer, and you know, I, I never would have imagined that uh, things would work out the way they did, but I feel like it was um, about going somewhere far, learning a new language, and you know, kind of freelancing until I started filming Ai Weiwei, and that was my first film. Debbie. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, definitely Brown steered me into making film, but my freshman year, my first 
um, semester, the first class I took was um, in the, I think it's called the Modern Culture and the Media Pro Department now, which at that point was called Semiotics, and it was Intro to Semiotics. <laughs> yeah, Yay. Semiotics, where you had to write essays without any borders, and you know, no, it was... Uh, Bob Scholes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I remember, um, I, you know, taking this very high European film theory class, not understanding a thing that I was reading about, and actually had to get enlist help from, from my very, you know, bright and, uh, uh, you know, clever uh, housemates and roommates to understand what was going on. But I had actually, um, who, um, I had actually always wanted to make films. I think my generation, maybe you guys in, in 91 could um, testify to this, is we were sort of the first generation that was raised on the blockbusters, you know, like, you know, Star Wars and um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, and we kind of, I felt like in our generation at Brown, we, you know, maybe be, previous to that it was med school and law school, but everyone coming out of Brown was wanting to go to film school and wanting to make films. <laughs> and Brown was certainly encouraging us to do that, you know, and for me it was more of the, um, a percolating ground for ideas. Um, I took, um, you know, I took um, independent studies in what was then called the Third World Center, which is now, I think, the Brown Students of Color. Um, and I always wanted to make films that um, expressed um, stories from underrepresented communities such as the Asian American community, which all of my films have been about. Um, after college, I just, you know, headed to New York and said, I threw myself at filmmakers and said, can I, what can I do? I want to learn how to make films. I ended up in the editing room um, working with um, filmmakers from, um, you know, making films about women who were um, on the border um, working in Korean women who were working, you know, um, um, basically servicing American military. Um, and, you know, I basically worked in the editing room, worked with some really great filmmakers, um, and then sort of, and then became a director. And, yeah. I mean, I, I hear some common themes, like not all of you were Film, were, were shooting or filming or learning how to shoot, but you kind of picked up the camera because you had an idea and a passion about um, whether or not it was activism or, or storytelling. I mean, do you, do you think of yourselves as uh, storytellers, journalists, activists, a combination of the three? Is it my turn? Yeah, yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take it away. Um, I, I'm definitely a journalist, but I couldn't do what I do if I wasn't a storyteller, because so much of the way I kind of find a story um, or, or figure out the storytelling is, is to find the narrative arc, and I try to do that through sort of, you know, looking at every subject and coming up with an original new way of kind of dissecting it. And, and I think I use the sort of techniques that um, you know, a fiction writer would, you know, what, what would be the best opening scene and, and where's my climax and what's the character conflict and tension and, you know, you use all those techniques and hopefully it shows in the very not so dull documentary, but... I mean, do you, do you all think that, that the craft of documentary storytelling has, um, has picked up in terms of understanding uh, narrative structure and coming up with, uh, you know, dramatic stories uh, that will engage people in a way? I think it has, certainly. I mean, I think the analysis in the, from the beginning here that, you know, 30 years ago documentaries were a little bit like spinach. And, <laughs> you know, now, I mean, people are really seeking them out. And I think that as filmmakers, we're we are looking at narrative and, and dramatic films um, for ideas and structure and character and all of these uh, areas that I think we're seeing in, in kind of the, the movie theaters and we're taking ideas from those to, to both make films that are engaging and, and maybe also you know, teach you a thing or two. Yeah. So, um, and I think that you can see in the marketplace that the documentaries <laughs> You know, they make money. I mean, not a lot, but they're, they're you know, <laughs> but there yeah, we'll is, get to that. They're, you know, they have that potential and people go to theaters and watch them. And 
I say, well, I think the landscape's also changed. And yeah. it's going the other way, too. I think narrative films are looking a lot towards oh, documentaries. documentaries for sure. Well, in what way? Um, both, uh, not just to get good stories, kind of in the way that I feel like even documentary sometimes comes from print journalism, might inspire a documentary filmmaker, and then they go further. But now I feel like narrative filmmaking, it's both about finding the story, but even the actual way that the documentary filmmaker puts together the arc, um, you know, all of that is stuff that people are even, you know, uh, getting remake rights or, you know, bringing documentary filmmakers on um, as consultants or actually, you know, to wholesale license their film. But I think you're right, and I think it's a good point. Stylistically, you see, you know, in tele on TV shows, 24 hour, whatever the show is, that it's like a verite feel to it, mm -hmm. handheld yeah. cameras. Totally. Um, and then I think, you know, films like Last Days in Vietnam, there are many people who are trying to remake that into a narrative. So, you know, I think they're also looking at source material mm -hmm. at our film. How about the use of humor? I mean, Debbie, you're dealing with a serious subject, but you took a very humorous approach to it. Talk about humor in documentaries. Oh, yeah. I mean, that has a huge evolution. I think nowadays, I think for me, that's one of the most important things for me is, is the storytelling. And I, I don't think I could make a film that wasn't funny. Um, and funny and documentary, you know, they didn't use, used to go hand in hand. When I first started, my the, one of the first films I edited, um, which won an Emmy, is called AKA Don Bonus, and it's about a seven, uh, like an 18-year-old Cambodian American um, in his last year of high school. We did not use music. That was the film. I mean, except for um, diegetic music, which you know, there's another semiotic term out there for you. But like, it, we did not use a score because the filmmaker was a, so, sort of very much from that kind of verite tradition. Um, and nowadays, I mean, my film, Allison's film, has a beautiful score. I remember that from your film. And um, you know, I hired a composer. And there's a lot of techniques that we're using that are drawing from any you know type of um, narrative, commercial, sometimes. Um, music video at times. I mean, it's it's a very very different um, form now. Where um, I, when I started, which was a long time ago, you wouldn't you wouldn't consider using those techniques. You would be sort of it would be frowned upon. Mm -hmm. um, that wouldn't be considered journalistic or um, observational. Um, and now it's just a different different landscape. It's really fun actually for us. I think. And first person as well as yours was yeah. much more frequent for people to put themselves in a film. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, in terms of kind of the question of journalism, you know, I do think that what we do is a form of journalism, and you use journalistic techniques for sure. Um, but I do think there's kind of a narrative quality where you're pulling people in. I think, you know, I did a film that you had mentioned, Ethel, which was about my mother, right? So in that film, I narrated that film, despite this horrible voice that I have, <laughs> so awesome. um, because I wanted the audience to know, you know, this is my mother, and it is my take on my mother. So, you know, there's no pretense of objectivity, and I think that part of what we you know, both struggle with as documentary filmmakers and also, you know, is, is kind of a pleasure of the challenge of it is to help the audience understand what the film is and what the expectation should be and where it's coming from. So if you set that out at the beginning, if people understand that at the beginning, this is first person or this is whatever, that's well, the, you know. I think there's a language to it yeah. and I think there's a communication to that. And, you know, if I was sort of, if I was pretending that this is the objective film about my mother, then that, that feels wrong to me. That feels dis, disingenuous, dishonest. So, so a lot of it is, I think, negotiating that terrain. And that often happens within the first couple minutes of a film, I think, of kind of, this is where we're coming from. You know, a frontline documentary might be very different than a you know, much more personal documentary. And communicating that to the audience is important and relevant. So, you made a reference to um, films making money. Let's talk about the business a little bit in terms of um, you know, making a career and how you fund these films and, and maybe how that's changed uh, for each of you. You have very different career paths and I wonder if you could talk about that a bit. 
start that way. Start yeah. that way? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll start there. <laughs> um, yeah, I worked as an editor for a long time, and editors are always in demand on documentaries if you ever, if you want, yeah. <laughs> if your child yeah. needs to, Looking wants for to an be editor. a yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> um, But the Seeking Asian Female, um, which was the first feature that I directed, I had directed other short films. Um, I got, I had to put it together. I mean, if you looked at the credits, there's about f uh, five or six funders out, you know, from, um, public television, down through all the foundations. There are a lot of foundations that support women filmmakers nowadays. There's some really great play, um, organizations like Chicken and Egg Pictures. Um, I have funding from the Women in Film Foundation, which is in Los Angeles. And then, you know, um, Center for Asian American Media, which is uh, part of the minority consortia of PBS. So it's a, a foundation so, model to, that, that you're looking for. We did a Kickstarter. We did three mm -hmm. Kickstarters. So we did crowdsource funding. We had fundraising parties. I mean, I'm sure, Allison, you probably went through a similar yeah, thing. Really but, you know, when you're doing totally independent filmmaking where it's just like a one, you know, it's like a, almost like a one-woman show, you know, you have to scrounge. <laughs> Ask your rich uncle for some money. <laughs> kind of um, yeah, I feel like you doing independent film means you wear so many hats, uh, especially on a documentary level where I think you're able, I mean, it was like, but between both getting the film made in terms of the financing and also the production, where I was like, is it, is it embarrassing how many of the things like that I ran sound and shot it? And, you know, like you don't want to like put all that out there because maybe that's like makes it look like it's small potatoes if you're like, I did so many things. But um, but the business side actually does become a big part of it. I mean, um, I also did a Kickstarter for Never Sorry. Um, I you know, filming it while I was also working as a, an accredited journalist in Beijing. It was kind of something that I was, um, you know, just able to live uh, kind of more affordably back then um, in, in Beijing and also on my uh, savings and working as a journalist. And then any money that I could raise while I was shooting it was really to pay anyone who I needed or for the travel or something because I always traveled a lot. Um, and then coming back, it, we sort of did the rounds of foundations of, you know, uh, applying for a lot of grants and you get some and you don't get others. That always happens. Um, and as your film has more momentum, I feel like more, everybody wants back a winner. So that's the other thing. People are really excited to help you once you already have a lot of it shot, when, once it's already in a polished enough form that they can see what it is. And again, even then, some people, you know, just want to come on board when they hear that it's going to Sundance. <laughs> um, so I feel like I had a, a really great, like you said, sort of like first uh, crack at it. And then since then, I've really just been trying to figure out, okay, what does it mean to have a career? I feel like maybe in some ways kind of doing it, not that it's in rever reverse order, because I think that's something that happens to most people is like, you know, once you have your first kind of bigger film, and then you're like, okay, now what? If you're working as an independent mm -hmm. filmmaker. Yeah. So, so maybe you can answer that question, Rory. How, how do you have a career at this, and how is how have you seen the landscape change in terms of yeah. funding? Yeah, I mean, I think it's changed enormously. Yeah. You know, since '91. I mean, you know, the first film, Women of Substance, I did. Uh, that film, you know, took me. It would have taken me whatever eight months to make, but it took maybe three or four years because I spent all of that time fundraising. Um, and at that time, you know, the, the kind of cable was just emerging and the, the demands for documentary were, were starting to increase. But at that point, it was really, you had PBS, HBO, and a few other outlets, but it was, you know, it was pretty few and far between and the budgets other than HBOs were, you know, pretty, pretty low. So, you know, now we have Netflix and Amazon and we have, there's corporations that are looking for branded content and, um, and then you have entire cable networks whose life depends on documentaries, you know, National Geographic and Discovery and, um, and HBO continues to be at the forefront of that, and PBS, you know, and so the, the demand for it and the money that's in the marketplace has increased substantially. Um, so, you know, I think that you now can, can make a living making documentaries. I mean, you know, listen, it's still 
a huge struggle and you have to you have to kind of pound the pavement still and kind of go out there and pitch and, and push your ideas. But I think there there are at least opportunities there and you know and I think you can also make a living as an editor and as a director of photography and you know you, you um, there's there's a world out there that is real and and there's real money behind it um, in I you know uh, I'm been a little less independent than uh, these fabulous filmmakers I, I've spent most of my career producing for PBS frontline um, and I think the difference, at least at the network, is that we used to have, I feel like, a lot more time and perhaps resources felt sort of more plentiful. Now it's sort of like, um, you know, we'd make a film in a year and you'd be out in the research 73 days in Cairo while you identified whoever you were filming. Now it's sometimes sort of make an entire hour and three months and sometimes it has to do because the content is very newsworthy and you're trying to inform the public and it's a public service to get something out quickly um, but we do a lot more with a lot less at least from my end um, and um, I'm about as well paid as I was maybe 20 years ago <laughs> so, um, so in some ways the technology is a double-edged sword right yeah. because it allows you to do so many things on your own and yet and also the expectations also are that it's going to look fantastic I mean there's there's both of that with the you know the improvements in cameras and editing availability yeah for sure well, I feel like that's why in terms of kind of figuring out career paths and trying to challenge pick what projects interest me and also I think can make me a better filmmaker. And I am sort of pushing for opportunities because I'm like, okay, I've done one where I, you know, wore a lot of hats, but actually it's a different kind of gatekeeper level to work on a project where there's money to hire a DP or where there's money to have, you know, mm -hmm. a DP who also has a camera assistant and like has, it's a nice camera and it, like the, the kind of, more polished things um, look, you know, the, you know, it, it, you can bootstrap it, but there's also, um, it kind of felt like a luxury, like I was like to have a crew or like a producer, like things like that. So I feel like for me, it's like trying to push into opportunities to mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. things that uh, allow me to leverage other resources. Um, and I think that you know, the flip side is you can always go and make something on your own. And I think that that should be really empowering. And I, you know, I'd rather do that when I'm doing it by choice and not feel like I'm doing it because it's the only way I know how to do something or it's the only kind of project that people will let me do, you know. Were you doing that, Debbie, making this film while you were doing editing jobs or, yeah, you were gonna? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's really how you had to, I mean, I think that any industry where technology has been introduced, you'll see that there's been this amazing democrat democratization of the uh, technology, but at the same time, services are no, no longer paid for. <laughs> so it's like it's it's absolutely and fil filmmaking is is um, is a great example of that. We're all expected to do so much more because there's so much more technology, but it's um, it's um, you know it, it influences even you know. Um, big outlets like Frontline um, and um, where, you know, I think that all of our filmmaking is making and is being influenced by these YouTube video, um, you know, prodigies who are making little short films with their GoPro camera or even with their iPhone, right? Um, and that sort of, um, the, um, those deadlines that, you know, their instantaneous gratification are sometimes they're kind of trickling down into feature length filmmaking, mm -hmm. which is traditionally something that basically costs a lot of money. <laughs> so it's this weird um, kind of contradiction. Yeah, you can do it for really cheap and you can do it, you can spend a lot of money too. Yeah. Um, directing has traditionally been a male job, especially in you know, feature films and fiction films. I mean, famously, 
uh, the percentage of female directors of big ticket films is 4% are women. But that number in documentaries, there are many more women who are directors of documentaries. I, I looked it up last night, 37%. It's not 50, but it's still a lot higher. What, why do you think that is? And has have you seen the business change in terms of attitudes toward women? Um, well, I have a strong opinion about that, so I'll <laughs> like, <hope laughs> happily express yeah, it. Here. Um, I was actually I was one of the producers on the Maker series, yeah. and so and uh, this was the series about women, um, and I produced a segment on on women in Hollywood. And so one of the things we did in telling that story is looking at the history of money and how that influenced women and kind of the impact that had. And it was interesting looking back on the history of Hollywood because when, when before we, the, the um, sound came to Hollywood, uh, most of the directors were women and it was considered kind of a, a marginal art form. And then when they introduced sound and people started going to the box office and it started making money, it went from women being the majority of directors to there being, I think, one woman who, who continued to be a director <coughs> in those early years. And I think if you, uh, when you look at that trajectory and how they're, you know, 4%, as you say, women directors in Hollywood today, um, that that is, again, looking at the amount of financing that goes into those big films, the big uh, dramatic films, uh, shuns women out in that industry. And with documentaries where the budgets aren't as big and they aren't as significant and there seems to be less at stake, there's a higher tolerance for women. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing. Uh, Sundance discovered that uh, young filmmakers who won awards at Sundance, if they were men, suddenly they were being offered these big budget films to Spider -Man. do. Spider-Man. Spider-Man by a fairly asshole. inexperienced or yeah. younger, younger filmmaker. Women winning awards at Sundance, not getting the big films. Yeah. So Hollywood is sexist. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there seems to be more of awareness of this. Do you think it's changing? Um, you know, I don't think it's changing, really. And I, I actually, I'm a, uh, one of the governors on the on the academy for the film, you know, for whatever the the film academy, where there's been, you know, a big backlash against the fact that um, there were very, you know, there was basically no films that were recognized this year that had African Americans or people of diversity, and very few women were celebrated. Um, and you know, it's it is it's it's bad. I mean, it's bad. I don't know what to tell you, but you know, it is it is an uphill battle, and it is real. And it's there's racism and there is sexism. I feel like it influences again where what I am doing. I guess in the immediate future, when I talk about like trying to build a career where I have opportunities for myself. To me, what that means is like where people are willing to bet on you for bigger budgets. To me, that like you don't need it always to make every film, but I don't like the idea that, you know, there's like a section of the filmmaking world where I'm like welcome and everybody's kind of comfortable with me there, but if I wanted to do something with a bigger budget, that that might be more difficult. So I feel like right now, um, I think it also has to do with like women filmmakers um, really pushing for those opportunities. Like, I not agree. saying that it's like on us to change it in a way, but it's like, I actually feel like going around and being like, this is my goal. Like, I do want this and letting people, whether it's the, you know, branded content where there are bigger budgets and even like in the, basically even in the commercial world, there are very right. few women. Mm -hmm. And that's where sure. documentary filmmakers, you know, who are some, you know, directors can subsidize their careers too, yes. right? And now. that is very hard to break in. Yeah, and that, so that is something that so I that, spent the last that, year. So that, explain that, explain what that's the world of making uh, branded content or commercials yeah. that you would, yeah, yeah you would be the director. You know, and, and I mean, I've certainly seen people who are on a similar career path and had similar accomplishments that I've had who have a lot more success in the commercial world than I have or Liz has had or, you know, other women who have, are, you know, quite accomplished. 
Um, so I think that, that it continues, and that's where a lot of the big money is. So. I'm, Marcella, your, your boss at Frontline, or the, the woman you're producing for at Frontline, now is, now is a woman taken over that well, very prestigious uh, for, series. Uh, for a very long time on the door of my office, I had a picture of all my former bosses, and they were all old white men. <laughs> and it had a little sign that said old white men on it. And, and nowadays, that picture is no longer there, and I have a fabulous... Uh, young uh, a woman that's around 43 years old or something that's now the head of Frontline, and, and uh, many of my colleagues are women. I, I must say, though, that it's the kind of career I chose not to have children in part because I couldn't figure it out. I was having these crazy deadlines and all these foreign reporting trips, and one day I woke up and I was like 46, and I was like, well, I forgot to have kids, you know, <laughs> and so, um, but some people manage it and do amazingly and have these kids and, and, and make two films a year, and I'm kind of blown away, but um, my, uh, my obsessive compulsive disorder, whatever it was, didn't allow me to figure out that, but yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking the other day that our, country is you know, so polarized, we're talking about this all the time. Um, how, what do you do to try to get your films out there so that they're not just speaking to the converted? You know, that you're doing a film that you want to have, you all talked about wanting to have an impact to do stories that make a difference. I mean, do you, do you think about this, about getting, having your films be seen by people who might not necessarily think originally they'd be interested in that topic? I can jump yeah. in. Um, <coughs> humor. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I use that. Um, humor? Humor, yes. I mean, my film, um, okay, so I don't know if you guys know the term yellow fever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not the disease from mosquito-borne <laughs> disease. But um, so if you talk to anyone within the Asian American community, they know exactly what that is. Um, and if you're, they're a woman, they've experienced it. Um, if, but outside of that, um, you know, no, I had to do a lot of explaining. Um, and that's how it is, I think, for so many Asian American stories, you know. Um, they, it, there's, um, you know, we studied this in intro semiotics, you know, when I was 25 years ago and as a freshman. Storytelling from the age of time is done from a very white uh, male or patriarchal perspective. And you, if you're gonna do something that's different, it, it requires, some form of, you know, you have to use the language of film to translate. Um, and that's basically what I'm trying to do. Um, every story that you think about is, you have to think about it in terms of who is it gonna speak to and how am I gonna get this, make a message that I want to be true and authentic to my community to actually speak to uh, a universal audience. And did that, ha did that happen with your film? Did you? find people who watched it who were really surprised by this? And yeah, you know, it was kind of amazing, um, I think, for my film is that um, it's, it's a woman's film. I mean, it, it really is, you know, it, it follows this. Um, so the main character, that goofy, smiling guy, Stephen, is, uh, he was 60 years old at the time. He was determined to find a wife from China. He went online for about a decade looking for one. <laughs> I never thought he would. I thought it was going to be this film about failure. And then he ended up finding this woman who was like 30 years old who agreed to marry him over the internet. Um, and I followed their relationship for the first two years to see if it would, if it was going to, you know, if, would they make it. And um, it became a film about marriage and relationships. I mean, it was definitely fundamentally a film about Western men who are objectifying Asian women in a really gross way, um, and it's about, you know, it's feminist, and it's about racism, and, but, you know, it was actually a story about marriage, and a story about love, um, yeah, kind of in a creepy, kind of racist way, but, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, it, it rose to these sort of more universal levels, but, and to see that happen, you know, when you take your film out there, and, I mean, Ai Weiwei was not probably known, the, the filmmaker that um, Allison um, portrayed was not very well known before her film probably and then you take it out there and people see it and they you know it, it's that kind of feeling is you, you can't make that happen unless you're really thinking about um, how to 
um, translate your film and tell your story in a universal way, I think, right? That's so well put, and I definitely agree about humor, too. I feel like, in general, to me, that's also such a fundamental part of the human experience that I feel like, you know, films that are, that there's always going to be at least a touch, even in the darkest moments, I think that that's how people get through them. So if you're really connecting to the people who are in your story, you know, who are going through, you know, again, it could, you know, in, in war, in poverty, I feel like that's, like, just a human you know, that's the human spirit, and that's, you know, people, you know, ha have a sense of humor there. And I think it's also really helpful to bring an audience in to, to a world. Um, and yeah, Iowa was definitely not as well known at all back then. And when people would be like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm making this movie about this guy, Ai Weiwei, he's a, and if people are like, what, who's that? I don't know what that is. I was like, oh, I'm really bad at pitching. <laughs> Basically, I was like, oh, it's really hard for me to describe this in a few sentences, why you should care. That's why I'm making a movie about it. I mean, then, then I would, I did have to get better at that. You know, you can't like rest on that. Trust but, me, trust me. But I did have a lot of, because when, when you're in something so deeply and you see all the complexities, and I feel like for me, the desire to make a movie is because I don't want to reduce it to, because I think it's something that's very hard to reduce to a log line of like, you know, one to three sentences. And of course you have to. I'm not saying you can get away without doing that and you should be good at that. And once you do that, you really understand your film in a lot of ways. But, you know, the beauty is you're like, that's why I want to make it. I want you to spend time with this person. I don't want to tell you everything I think. I want you to, you know, go through this journey and then decide what you think. I mean, similarly, Roy, with Vietnam, very personal. You told it from a very personal angle. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I think, I mean, honestly, I think every film has its own kind of uh, purpose and sort of understanding of what kind of impact you want with the film. And there's sometimes, you know, I think when I started off making films, I was coming from a much more political perspective and wanting to have impact, tell a good story, but really, you know, so my early films were about, you know, women and substance abuse, and then I made a five-part series about the global AIDS epidemic, and we did a whole advocacy campaign around that, and it was on HBO, and, and you know, in a film like that, I want people to know what's going on with the global AIDS crisis, and I want our policies to change, and I'm doing screenings on Capitol Hill, and I'm showing it to 50 senators, and I'm trying to make a difference. And in that situation, you know, like Senator Leahy came up to me afterwards and said, I just put an extra, you know, and that at that time, they were, they were, we were putting thousands of dollars in the global AIDS epidemic. He said, I'm putting an extra $25 million in the budget because of this film, right? So like that, you know, then I want impact. And then in other instances, you know, with, with like last days in Vietnam, it feels like such a, a such a, great story to tell and an important story and a story that you know we all thought we knew and I thought I knew it and I started researching it and I was like I don't know this story this is an incredible story and and then it has so many implications in my mind about what we're doing today in Afghanistan and Iraq and how do you get into a war and when you're getting into a war are we thinking about how we're going to get out of the war and what happens to the people who are left behind when we leave and you know all of these issues that we're struggling with today so you know I want to get that film out there in a big way and and it's great to be on PBS because it has access to, you know, it's in 98% of households in this country. So that's its own just huge number. And then to be in, have a theatrical screening where you can have an audience who is actually watching the film and not checking their iPhone and not cooking dinner and not talking <laughs> on the phone is its own meaningful experience, you know? And then being in f film festivals and so I think you know, these films have different opportunities and different ways to kind of share the information and what you're trying to get out of it and what, what message, if any, you're, you're trying to convey. I'm doing a film right now about a surfer. That's not really an advocacy <laughs> film, you know. <laughs> you can find an ad. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it should be fun and entertaining and there's other, you know, purposes for these films, I think. It's a range. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, 
I, I guess as, as we're sort of wrapping this up, I'm thinking if you all have advice for any young filmmakers in the audience or perhaps their parents who are wondering about <laughs> the career as a documentary filmmaker, if you have thoughts about that. Um, in the audience is Kiki Barnes, who was my intern on Chasing Heroin. She's a class of 2016, and congrats. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I, I guess my advice is you better make sure you want to do this. <laughs> so. Something I wanted to say, I don't know if it's, I think it's kind of advice, but I realized I should have said about what I got from Brown in terms of doing this career. I, I always say the biggest thing that I got from Brown was um, learning from my friends, and uh, I was really inspired by um, people who I felt like were fearless in just making choices with following their passions, wh whether it was um, travel or art or um, what they wanted to study. And I just feel like it helped open up my mind. And I think we all, they would probably not necessarily even see them, they would see themselves too as people who needed to learn. Like we all like kind of mutually, I think helped each other, hopefully, you know, not feel uh, encumbered by expectation or by fear and to just kind of follow what you want to do, have a plan when you do it, because you know, you have to like make a living and so you're <laughs> figuring that out and you have to like, gain skills along the way and find the opportunities. But I feel like certainly for independent filmmaking, you need that, because there was no track. You know, everybody and everyone up here, and even if it's not independent filmmaking, but filmmaking in general, there's everybody has a really interesting story about how they got to what they're doing and there's no clear path. So I think as long as you feel um, like you're inspired to, to try, that's like really the first step. Um, uh, I guess I can speak to advice for parents. Um, I'm, a, I'm a parent, I'm, I'm an old parent, so my kids are really young. And actually I'm, I'm making this, another personal documentary right now about um, what it takes for a child to succeed in today's high stakes academic environment on the road to college, and particularly from an Asian American's perspective. So, you know, I'm looking at um, tiger mothers and um, pushing to get into college. Um, and what I see from a lot of parents, at least in that community, is, um, you know, this need for um, your child to, you know, to get an Ivy League education, like one from Brown, um, and to have, you know, to come out of it, you know, as a, with, you know, going into law or medicine or, you know, maybe, um, maybe technology, maybe, you know. Um, <laughs> that sounds a little risque, but, you know. Um, so, but what I think, you know, for those of us who want to do filmmaking, which, you know, frankly, is not always considered the most respectable um, career path, um, is that you, if you're the parent and it's your child who wants to do that, is that you should take them seriously. They should take themselves seriously. Um, that is, you know, if, if you don't, then they're gonna spend their whole lives wondering, you know, if they should, and also trying to maybe prove that they should, or, you know, I mean, it, it, there's a big difference between having your idea and, and envisioning the reality of it happening versus wondering whether it's the right thing to do or not. Yeah. Um, I, I would just add that, uh, you know, as I had mentioned, I'm a, I was a women's studies major, and there was a bit of a backlash about, about, you know, these kids who were women's studies major and what were you going to do possibly in the world with a women's studies degree. I feel like I've really used my women's studies <laughs> degree, and. Um, and feel like it actually gave me a lot of tools that I still apply and use and, and fall back on today. And, and so I feel really lucky to have had that experience here at Brown and, and, and very grateful for that. Um, in terms of advice, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I'm going to get practical. I think that, that for kids who are graduating, well, they could come intern at Moxie Firecracker, and we would welcome you. <laughs> um, I do think uh, kind of an internship or an assistant position starting off in a, you know, in a small production company can be enormously valuable and really help to 
understand, you know, leaving college, how kind of the real world works and how these films actually get made. Um, I think that because of the changes in technology, you know, when, when we all started off to get a, ca a broadcast quality camera, probably started at $60,000. An editing system was, you know, $350,000. I mean, these, you know, to buy it, so you end up renting all of this. Now, today, you can get a broadcast quality camera for under, a, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. under $1,000, and you can turn your computer into an editing system. So I think for kids and young people who are really driven with an idea um, and, and can go out there and just start making a film and have the resources to do that, that's fantastic, too. Um, film school, eh, but that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and if you make a film with an iPhone, hold it this way versus this way. <laughs> Well, I, I just want to thank you so much. Really an inspiring group of Brown grads. Thank you thank so you. much.